All right, well, I'm going to talk basically about three things. I feel like, first of all, I need to talk about what's being called my Holocaust comments because it's the elephant in the room. And I just want to set the record straight as far as I'm concerned on that issue, which I haven't really been able to do, particularly to people in Germany. Um, but that's not really the main focus. It's more like it's, it feels like that's necessary to do and put something on the public record about it. And then the second thing I'm going to talk about is some of the innovations and developments internationally in XR around mobilization. I'm going to argue that basically mobilization is the core of our strategic purpose and just the core of our moral purpose in so much as it enables us to fulfill the moral objectives of XR in terms of the three demands. And then I'm going to finish off making a few more speculative comments around the reasons why mobilization hasn't been so effective due to cultural and philosophical problems in on the left generally um, and why those need to be challenged in order for us arguably to fulfill our objectives. So the main, main talk, part of the talk about mobilization is fairly sort of sociological and, and empirical and it's something I know a lot about so I'm going to be fairly clear about that uh, but obviously this the things my views about the left generally are, are, are a lot more disputable and and speculative so th that's more like to create some dialogue about the situation okay so i'm just gonna like you know deal with the main thing first which is about the holocaust comments and about xr germany and what have you and i just want to make like six or seven key points which you may or may not wish to accept but this is my self-understanding of the situation so the first thing i want to say and i've said a few of these things before is that I feel um, enormously apologetic about the upset that has been caused by the publication of those comments. I said that at the time, I did two Facebook posts about it, I publicly apologised for the upset that has been caused and that's not something I've changed my mind about. It wasn't my intention to create the, the upset that the comments caused and obviously I didn't have control over uh, how, how they were communicated because it was done by a corporate owned newspaper in Germany, as you know. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is just for the record, I think that the Holocaust is an absolutely horrendous and obscene event in history. And it's something that's motivated my horror of injustice and war and genocide right through my life ever since I was 12 and I discovered uh, what, had, what had been going on. So I just want to make that as clear as possible. There's never any intention to relativize it in the sense of putting it down in any way or form. And I want to say that the interview that I did, which ironically I thought was quite a good interview because uh, I talked to a 20 something old uh, German journalist and we had a one and a half hour discussion which covered the whole range of quite tricky subjects including God and love and death and existentialism and the German sort of role in the world. So as you can imagine it dealt with some quite profound things and although no doubt no one will get to hear the full interview I think if you heard the whole interview you would agree that the whole interview was really based around a total and abhorrent horror of, of um, mass death and that's why I've dedicated my life to doing is being opposed to such events. So I think, although I can't remember the particular context of making those comments, I think it was broad, broadly in the context of having an argument with a journalist who, as you probably know, when you talk to journalists who do press work, these journalists are enormously resistant to emotionally connecting or politically connecting with the absolute dire situation at the time of emergency. And it was in that context, I think, that I was being what you might call provocative towards the journalist in relation to the idea that she fully accepted how terrible the Holocaust was, but she wasn't prepared to take seriously the absolute dire situation we face, particularly in regard to the planned genocide of people in Africa if you go over two degrees centigrade. The, uh, the next point I want to make is about the, the meaning of the word, um, the phrase, uh, just another fuckery. One of the problems with that phrase is that it's very difficult to translate 
I think we need to understand that that interview happened on my farm in Wales and it wasn't anything to do with XR, it was about promoting my book, 21st um, Common Sense in the 21st Century. And I spent 30 years working with agricultural labourers who are very working class guys who swear all the time. And if you say that something is just another fuckery, what you're actually saying is it's an expression of expressiveness. It's not an analytical phrase. It's not a mathematical calculation of what's more important than something else. It's a working class phrase, which basically means everything's fucked up. <laughs> and it doesn't mean that the thing that you're opposed to is less or more fucked up. It's just a everything's fucked sort of phrase. So in that context, it's, that's, what, that's how I would try to explain it, as it were, in the context that I think the Holocaust was obviously an absolutely appalling event. Okay, so just for the record, I'm not anti-Semitic, or at least if I am, I'm not aware I am. My self-understanding is I fully support uh, anti-racism, anti-Semitic action, always have and always will. Um, as it happened, as I said to a number of journalists afterwards, and as I said to the journalist on the day, I think, like I was brought up a Christian, I was brought up in the prophetic Judeo Christian tradition, and a large part of that, of course, is connected with the Old Testament and the Jewish tradition of telling truth to power. And that's very much where I'm inspired. So ironically, I would say I'm actually pro-Jewish in the sense that I'm pro the Jewish tradition, uh, that element of the Jewish tradition. OK, so just moving on to specifics. Um, if you want to ask a clarifying question, that's great. You can just let me finish this little section. That would be great, Lorenz, yeah? Um, so, um, yes, one of the things which is most difficult about the episode was that the memo that I wrote suggesting that we do truth telling in other situations was written after the interview, not before it. So there's been a malicious uh, attempt to defame me as far as I'm concerned internationally by people who don't like me in, in the movement because it's just a matter of fact that the memo was written afterwards. And so that produces no evidence that I intentionally went into the interview intending to cause disruption. Now, obviously, no one can actually know whether I intended to or not because no one can read my mind. But for the record, I'm more than happy to swear on my children's lives, and I've got four children, that I did not, I emphasise, I did not go into that interview with an intention of causing disruption over comments on the Holocaust. I went into it to tell the truth, and that's how I approach all the, the media uh, interactions that I have. So I just want to finish off by saying that since I helped co-found XR, I've done around 200 interviews, and this phrase was, what, 30 seconds from one and a half an hour interview, and I've done hundreds of these interviews. And if you deal with the press, what you know, of course, is the press exists in order to manipulate information, in order to make money from it, or for ideological reasons. And a classic example of this is the move that the press makes when they take a statement of somebody, and many public figures have been subject to this move, they take a statement and then turn it into a proposition. So for instance, I said that if the climate catastrophe is not sorted out, then there will be bullets through the heads of people in the ruling class. That was a sociological prediction, and it's a well-established prediction that in times of social stress, then you get political violence. There's, that's entirely different from saying, I want it to happen, which obviously is self-evident. However, this is a regular move that the press makes in order to discredit people and do something that was done to me by the Times newspaper, for instance. So that brings me on to my sort of final comment about it, which is I think that if you want to have people speaking in the media, you need to understand that the media will try and manipulate it. And you've got two options which one is to go into an NGOS media strategy where no one says any truth telling at all and everything becomes very boring and sludgy, as you might say, or you encourage people to do truth telling in the global media and then you support them 
by calling out the corporate press and the corporate manipulation rather than doing the corporate press's work for them, as it were, by destroying the reputation of people who make errors, you know, willfully or not uh, in the media. And at the time, I didn't have any press support, and so I couldn't defend myself publicly. But now I happily have. <laughs> so if, uh, if there's someone listening to this who wants to manipulate what I'm saying, then you can be assured that I'll be straight out there with my press team saying that that's incorrect and the press is, is facilit facilitating uh, malicious, malicious actions, as you might say. So that's all I really have to say about it. Uh, I hope that's cleared up things a little bit. Um, and obviously you can make your own judgment on it. I don't particularly want to get into a big discussion about it because the main part of my talk is about mobilization. Uh, but if you do have a clarifying question, that's fine. If you want to have a bigger discussion, you can ask questions at the end if that's okay. I'm not trying to avoid scrutiny. I just want to get onto the main talk. Um, but I think Lorenz has got a question. So if it's a clarifying question, then please ask it otherwise if you can um, leave it to the end, but I don't know what you want to ask. Lorenzo. No, it's actually not a, not a clarifying question, but you bring up the point and you're talking 15 minutes about it. And I, all I heard was one little sorry and like 10 minutes about explanation why it was not that bad what happened. And I feel it's like just an explanation and not really sorry. And I know that there was a restorative justice circle afterwards. And they told in Germany that you did not really cooperate with them, that you broke up the, the agreements you had with them. And so that's what I want to say. So I don't, don't feel like you can tell like 10 minutes about this topic and just say, oh, only clarified, uh, only clarifying questions are allowed. That's not the, the way I feel we should discuss about such a, such a difficult topic for Germany, because for us, it's a really big part of mobilization because it demobilized our German movement, about maybe half of the people left afterwards in Germany from XR. So it was really a big part of demobilizing XR Germany. And so if we're talking about mobilization, maybe we should talk first about what we should don't do to demobilize every like our total movement. And for us now, it's really difficult to every time we talk to anybody in Germany, we have to firstly explain that we are not anti-Semitic and we are not all uh, governed by a, a leader, Roger Helm, who is like, because that's the way uh, it seemed for the media and for the press, that the leader of UK of Extinction Rebellion, because they don't understand that it's a decentral movement, that the leader of Extinction Rebellion in UK said something anti-Semitic, so all the movement has to be anti-Semitic. And that's what happened in Germany, and it was a big part of demobilization. So for me, it's really, uh, yeah into the topic of mobilization. Yeah, great. So thank you very much for those comments. So just to clarify, I, it's not like I'm trying to get out of being questioned about it. I did ask XR Germany to have a public discussion about it several times and they refused to do so. So it's just for the record, it's not like I don't want to be questioned about it. It's just because I haven't had the opportunity. And one of the reasons this is happening today, it, which is unofficial, is because XR Germany doesn't want me to speak. So it's, it, you can't have your cake and eat it, as you might say. <laughs> but in terms, of, in terms of the clarifying questions, that's just a procedural point, Lorenz. So we can, I, I mean, people can do whatever they, they, they like in terms of this particular session, but I would suggest that we mainly focus on the mobilization points that I want to make. And if you want to have another session where you want to have an open discussion about the comments and wider issues, I'm more than happy to be accountable. Um, so just hopefully you understand what I'm trying to say there. Um, what, what I would like to do is move on to the main part of the talk. And then obviously, if you want to question about mobilization in a broader context, then I'm more than happy to ask, answer questions about that. And as I said, if you want to have a specific session on, on the consequences of those comments and the morality of them, then I'm more than happy to do that. Um, I'll take a quick point from Michael and then I'll move on. And if people have got other questions, then they can leave it to the end of the talk. Uh, Michael. I just said I, I'm, I'm feeling very strange in this conversation. 
Um, I feel we're talking about anti-Semitism. I'm Jewish. Um, Israel has not been involved at all in this discussion to, to minor degree. So it's kind of interesting, this dynamics. I don't know really what to make of it. Um, I, I, I personally would like to talk to Lawrence afterwards and kind of like understand what's going on with this. Um, I just want to make a comment that in Israel, strangely enough, this whole issue hasn't become an issue. And I'm just wondering the differences and how that happened. Um, so I would you know, love to talk to people afterwards. Yeah, that's, that's great. So let's, let's just establish here, no one's trying to not talk about something, okay? It's simply a procedural situation and we only have a certain amount of time on this session. So there's a number of things that people might want to take forward from it. So what, I, what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna talk now more about the mobilization mechanisms which have been developed partially by myself and other people internationally in XR. Uh, as a something that can be, you know, taken on board or not taken on board. And these these questions are these issues or the information I'm going to give are separate from the issue of whether I'm good at good at creating mobilisation in Germany. Right? They're separate issues. So you can separate me and my comments from whether these points are valid or not in general. If you see what I mean. Okay. So. I'm going to, I'm going to um, make the general point that my understanding of Extinction Rebellion's success and purpose is mainly centered around mobilization, not strategy narrowly defined. So what I mean by that is because there's a climate emergency, the emergency, what the emergency means is that there's limited room for action strategy discussion in the sense that there's only really one mechanism to change society in the time we've got left, which is through mass civil disobedience. And you may wish to disagree with that, in which case that's probably an, a discussion. But the main proposition by a number of the co-founders is mass civil disobedience has to happen, it needs to happen in the major cities, because like according to literature, that's the, the most effective way you can bring about change. So the strategy element of it is not overly complicated. It's about creating civil resistance. And civil resistance in the last analysis is reasonably straightforward. I mean, it's difficult to create, but analytically it's fairly straightforward. So I would like to suggest in terms of framing the points I'm gonna give here, that the name of the game here is getting the numbers. Like civil resistance is largely a numbers game. You know, we were told by the police in the UK 3,000 people arrested, then that would lead to structural stress in the British political system, right, just because of the force of numbers and the number of people taking action over two weeks. So that raises the question of how you get the 3,000 people okay. into London or into a capital city. Um, yeah, if you can mute, please, if you're not already done so, that'd be great. So that, that raises the issue of how you get people into a position where they are willing to, to engage in civil resistance, which obviously risks arrest and potentially prison. Okay, so the second point I want to make is that one of the main propositions between XR's uh, mobilization strategy is that mobilization is really a function of psychological knowledge rather than political rhetoric. And my particular research area from King's College has mainly been uh, based upon the psychology of mobilization. In other words, people don't mobilize primarily due to adopting an ideology or a political morality. They partially do, but they mainly mobilize through psychological mechanisms, such as what other people are doing that they value and, and know, or whether they feel supported and loved and respected in the space that they enter into. In other words, it's a function of community cohesion, for instance. So what, in, in, this, in so much as it's a psychological problem, and it's a technical problem in that sense, then my proposition is that 
This really depends upon the micro design. And one of the big problems on the left is the generalization of the mobilization proposition. In other words, people will be rhetorical about it. They will say something like, we need to get out into people in Germany and mobilize them. Now, that doesn't actually mean anything in my view. Whether you're successful at mobilization or not depends upon a more modular and detailed analysis of why people mobilize. And I'm going to go through in a little bit of detail what I see as the state of the art in terms of the psychology of mobilization. Now, this is a moving area of study. So what I'm saying here is not, you know, the end point, but it's a number of pointers um, on how to do it well. And what I would suggest is the main reason why the UK has mobilized up to 200,000 people and other countries haven't isn't primarily cultural, though obviously that's an arguable point, but it's primarily about the micro design of the mobilization strategy in the sense that what we happened in the UK is we did a whole bunch of things that weren't done in other countries or weren't done as skillfully or as extensively. Okay, so the first thing is to sort of outline what the mobilization process is in a macro sense. So the mobilization process rotates around three or four stages. The first stage is to contact the people on the database in a particular geographical area. So you go to Brennan or something like that, and there's 50 people in the database. You contact those people on the database and you ask them to find a venue. Now, obviously this takes out of the equation COVID, but I'm putting COVID to one side for the moment. But assuming there is COVID, then you're looking at an online meeting. So they find a venue or an online space and they create a meeting. And at that meeting, then you have the heading for extinction talk. At the heading for extinction talk, there is always already a pathway to action, which is to have a meeting to set up an extinction rebellion group in that geographical area. And one of the micro designs is to always have the next meeting organized in the meeting that you're presently engaged with. So this, this relates to one of the main principles of mobilization, which is proximity. Proximity in terms of time, space, and emotion. So what I mean by that is, if you have a meeting and you say to people, we'll contact you about the next meeting, then there's, a, there's less proximity. What you really want to do is say, here's the heading for extinction talk, and we're having a meeting next week. Here's the Zoom link, here's the address, here's the time, and we'll see you all there. So people immediately know they don't need to receive an email, which obviously many of them won't look at. Okay, and once they go to that meeting, then there needs to be a pathway towards direct action. And what we've evolved in various places around the world, particularly in Australia and the US, is the idea that a critical principle is that people engage in moving their bodies at an early stage, i.e. that they go out and do some, some symbolic form of civil disobedience, like they'll stand in the road for two or three minutes and then go to a cafe. Now, the function of that is obviously movement building. No one's pretending that's going to bring about political change. But the, the adrenaline rush that people get through acting together in community and through doing something minorly transgressive basically helps to bond them into a commitment mode. So the principle behind this design is people are primarily mobilized, not through cognitive processes, but through emotional processes, or more specifically, through the biochemistry of action, right? We've all experienced this. You go on an action and you feel more committed because you've gone on the action. You don't feel committed and then go on the action. You go on the action and then feel more committed. So this is like a major change really from what you might call the over cognitive uh, rationalist enlightenment view of human nature, which is embedded in traditional left-wing thinking. So um, that's, that's the basic timeline. And obviously there's variations on the theme and sometimes it gets mixed up. People go in an action first and then go to a meeting and then go to a heading for extinction talk. But uh, the general timeline is get the database, 
create the talk, set the group up, do direct action, you know, symbolic direct action, then have training, civil disobedience training, and then go on a larger action. And the larger action in terms of optimal design needs to happen within four to six weeks. So if it happens within a fortnight, obviously people have got time commitments. And if it happens like in four months time, people forget about it. So there's a sweet spot for mobilization, which creates quite a lot of stress in the mobilization system because you know it's very difficult to get everything to go really quickly, but that's one of the challenges. So that's the optimal arrangement. So what's been developed in the US and in Australia, for instance, is having regular uh, national events every six weeks or two months. So that you're building up an ongoing industrialization, as you might say, of mobilization, right? It's not, you're not waiting uh, to do something once every twice a year, for instance, because that breaks the mobilization process. Okay, so that's like a broad outline of, um, of, of, of the process. So I want to spend a little bit of time about talk, talking about the talk itself and then a little bit about meeting design. So as far as the talk itself is concerned, one of the main problems with the talk is that in my view, it's been largely liberalized and middle-classized, as you might say, been turned into a science communication rather than an evangelical sort of, uh, evangelical call to arms. So again, what we need to understand in middle class political culture finds this very difficult to accept. When a larger political historical record, we need to understand, and this is, this is supported by modern scholarship, that people are mobilized through emotion, not through information. Okay, so what, 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 when I do talks, I never use a, a, um, a PowerPoint, right? What PowerPoints tend to do is, is dampen emotional connection because people subliminally associate it with informational, academic, and sort of science communication culture. What we need to create is more a sort of 19th century evangelical atmosphere. The, the person goes in, they look at people in the eye, and they give a banging speech, right? <laughs> this is what's happening. We're fucked, right? We've got responsibilities to our children. We've got responsibilities to the people that came before us. We've got to get out and engage in civil resistance. That's the message. You don't need to give loads of technical information in a heading for extinction talk. If you watch the original talk that I did in King's College, you'll see that it wasn't like, I, there was no PowerPoint, right? It was a bit of a mess because of the first time I'd done it, but it was visceral, you know? I, I took quotes from what happened in Germany and on the Eastern Front in the, in the, in the uh, um, World War II, and it was primarily focused on the coming of mass death, right? And that's basically what the Heading for Extinction talk is about. It's the prospect of mass death. And that was taken out of the talk. And I suggest if you want to be effective, you need to bring it in. And I think if you're doing the talk effectively, then 25% of your audience should be prepared to engage in civil disobedience at the end of it. That's what I would say is the average. And obviously the people that engage in doing the talk have to be extroverts and charismatic. One of the problems in the UK is we didn't have much quality control on it and people who weren't very good at communicating, you know, engaged in giving the talk and it dampened the effectiveness of it. So there's a little bit of a balance there between participation and quality control that you need to negotiate, obviously. But the main point of it is, is if you get a good speaker, you can double the amount of people that you mobilize. Um, and that's something to look out for, as you might say. All right. So in terms of the situation with, with the meetings, one of the, you know, just coming back to the general principle here, right, is people don't go to meetings in order to receive information, in order to engage in a rational decision-making process and then move on to civil disobedience. That's not how political mobilization works. It's certainly not what the psychology of motivation says, right? So just to reiterate, 
People engage in collective activity because of emotional connection, because they've got connections with people who are engaged in that group and they feel supported and loved by them, right? That's how human beings tick. In other words, for most human beings, most of the time, right, they're not primarily interested in politics. So one of the biggest problems with the political left in the Western world is it's dominated by people who are, are, are total outliers psychologically, right? You know, people like me and maybe some of you are motivated by reading books and getting into a big tiz about things, and then you go and act. That's not how 99% of the population works. Most people engage in politics because of its sociability, which is, explains why people move from left-wing opinions to right-wing opinions quite quickly, depending upon the structure of sociability in political space. In other words, if they feel more welcomed in a nationalist space, they'll become nationalist, right? If they feel more alienated in the left-wing space, then they'll leave that left-wing space. So I don't intend to moralise about that. I'm just saying that seems to be the case on the basis of the social science research. So what does this specifically mean? OK, so I'll go through in no particular order a number of what you might call micro designs. So one of the most important things which enables people to feel welcomed in a group is what happens in the first two minutes of entering the physical space. So when people come through the door into a space, if they're not immediately welcomed, they're going to frame that experience in the same sort of way as you do if you go to a party. Everyone's been to a party, presumably, and no one talks to you. And after about three or four minutes, you begin to hate it. And then you never really recover, right? Because you're sitting in, in the corner trying to work out who to speak to. So a, a, a political meeting is more like uh, what you might call a party, right? It's a social event. And the upshot of it is, is the most effective way to integrate people into that space is to go up to them within 30 seconds, explicitly welcome them, shake their hands, COVID allowing, and, and engage in some small talk, right? And then put them on a table in a space where they're facing other people and there's drink and food available so that they immediately engage in a conversation casually with other people in the space before the meeting. So if I was going to do this Zoom call properly, for instance, we could have had a little breakout group before we have the talk and you could talk to each other about, you know, X, Y and Z. OK, so another thing is about the language. So one of the biggest problems with XR is because it's become mainly an urban middle class movement of university educated people, it's extremely bad at communicating to ordinary people that don't have a university education. In other words, like without knowing it, you alienate people because the words you use are display a certain alienation and antagonism, right? And people pick that up subliminally. And what they say is, this is not for me. This is for these educated people, these urban middle class radical people. That's not for me. And what we need to bear in mind here, and you know, maybe I should have said this at the beginning, is once you're only going to create a mass civil resistance movement, and all mass civil resistance movements are based upon an alliance of many different personality types, many different cultures, and many different political opinions. But they're all united on a basic sort of moral consensus that what's happening is terrible. So what you need to do is to use a neutral language that encourages people from lots of different backgrounds to engage in that space. OK, so another thing that needs to happen in that space is when you're when you're saying whatever you want to say, you have to have a pathway to action. So one of the biggest mistakes of political meetings is everyone's totally convinced that something's terrible, but there's no pathway to action. So what the psychological psychological research says is if you want to get people to do things, you have to do two things. You have to persuade them and then you have to tell them what to do. If you don't tell them what to do, then they won't do anything because they don't know. So they'll be terribly upset about climate change. They'll go home and they'll be depressed and three days later, they won't do anything, even if they're getting an email. So you have to have a concrete pathway to action in the meeting. And concrete pathways to action need to be pluralistic. 
In other words, you don't want to say in the meeting, OK, everyone, everyone's got to stand in the road next week because some people won't want to, right? And some people won't be able to. So the best thing is what's called to provide a menu of options. And obviously, there's lots of different things that are valid and necessary in terms of the community mobilization. So what this means is people like to have the choice. Psychologically, if you tell someone that something's happening, then if they haven't got the choice, they don't own the option. If you give people, op people options, then they choose one of the options. And through the process of choosing it, they buy in more uh, into that option. So that's one micro design element. The other micro design element is the options have to be concrete in time and space. So in other words, you don't say, you don't stand up in the meeting and say, will someone be coordinator? No one knows what that means. And it's too abstract. What you say is, will somebody help me next week organize the chairs for the meeting, right? And then someone will put their hand up. And a little add on of that is don't ask general questions anyway, like ask certain individuals to do something. So this is another thing which a lot of people don't get is that if you want people to do things, then you should directly ask them, right? Which, you know, in the Anglo-Saxon sphere, we slightly humorously call headhunting. So if you're at the meeting and, you know, lots of people say to me around the world, they say, Roger, we have a meeting and no one will volunteer for anything. That's because you've asked the whole group. The psychology of getting people to do things is to directly ask them. So after this meeting, you know, I might ring Henning up and say, can you organize another meeting for me? And then he'll do it. Well, if I ask the whole group, it's like everyone's sort of looking at everyone else because no one really wants to do it, right? <laughs> so that's, that's, you know, there's three or four little elements there. And at the danger of, you know, using using what you might call entrepreneurial research. There's a book called um, Persuasion, the Psycho uh, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, which is probably the classic. And if you want a bit of Christmas reading, you can read that, um, though it's not very left-wing, I should warn you. But anyway, you know, that's the literature. All right, so I'm not going to exhaustively go through these points because if people are interested in meeting design, which is the heart of my research, that's why I Win my awards for, then we, you know, you can always get on a Zoom call and I can help you more with the details. Like that's the sort of flavor of the, the general point, right? That a meeting is either massively alienating or massively empowering, depending upon the micro design, right? So it's not like meetings are X or Y, it's all about how you design them. And the general design principle is the higher the participation in the meeting, the more likely people will become empowered. And empowerment, of course, is the prerequisite of action, right? People aren't going to go out and do things with you unless they feel happy and supported and empowered. So as a general principle, any meeting that's organized should have 50% participation, right? Unless people know people very well or it's some sort of lecture like I'm doing here. In other words, you introduce the topic and then people split into groups to talk about it and feedback. And another general principle is a meeting should never go on for more than one and a half hours because people get bored and alienated unless they're critical nerves, right? And it's important that meetings start on time and finish on time. And there's a moral element here, which is that if you have long meetings and they go on too long, you're basically excluding marginalized people or people that have are unable to stay longer because they don't have the privilege of time, particularly parents and poorer people. OK, so it's not just uh, a process thing, right? It's about if you want to get lots of ordinary people involved, then be organized, right? Start on time, finish on time and make sure it's well facilitated. And there's a whole, so that's another subject about effective facilitation, of course. OK, so what we try to do in America and in Australia is, is try and simplify the meets the, the organization of groups. And I'll just give you two sort of pointers here. One pointer is it's always useful to have a coordination group of the people that are super organized and they meet separate from the main meetings in order to overview and manage the group. So make sure the meetings happen on time, make sure coordination is happening properly, and they meet every week, you know, two or three or four people, not a lot of people. 
And then you have the main meetings and the main meetings should be short and action focused. And then you push all the details out into the subgroups. So the subgroups deal with all the nitty gritty stuff. If you start having lots of technical discussion in the main meeting, people get bored because it doesn't really interest them, right? So if you're having an action, then the details of the action are done by the action group. The date of the action is organized in the main group, for instance. And the three main groups that seem to make most sense, as far as I can see, is to have a media group, an actions group, and an integration group. And the integration group is very important because that's the group that's going to design enabling people to participate and it needs proactive attention, right? It's not a matter of people coming to the meeting and you know just assuming they're going to come to the next meeting. They need to have an email after the meeting, someone needs to phone them, and then they need to be you know phoned every five or six weeks, for instance. Okay. Um, All right, so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about the macro design. I think one of the biggest problems with XR mobilizations is that not professionally and well coordinated at a national level. And what it seems like one of the biggest factors of success, apart from the micro design, is to have a national group which works full time and arguably should be paid in order, in order to organize a national mobilization process. So this has been done several times. It was done in London before the April rebellion, where I headhunted about 15 people. About half of those people worked full time. We worked out this mechanism of setting up XR groups and we set up 20 XR groups in, in London in four weeks, right? By having a really well-organized process, you know, uh, contacting people on the database, creating social media, having the heading for extinction talk, creating the first meeting, civil disobedience training, and two weeks later, they were on the streets in London when there was 1,200 arrests. So that's, that basically was the prototype. And then what we did was we created a national, a national mobilization group um, the, a few months later. And what we did is we employed 17 people full time and they worked in groups of four and we split the UK into about seven areas, seven regions. And then each group of four people was engaged in setting up at least one or two groups a week. And we set up 50, Extinction Rebellion groups within about two months and then COVID hit. So that's what, what can happen on a national level. And we did the same thing in America. We had 17 people. We were moving towards 10 or 15 groups and then it died off because COVID basically made it really difficult. And it was obviously difficult because of Trump and what's been happening in America. What's been happening in Australia is there's a national coordination group. They've done a three day training. They've got eight full-time mobilizers now. They work in different states and they, they've got a list of groups to set up. So what they've done is they've gone through the database and they've identified 50 areas of Australia where there could be a group. In other words, there's a town, there's 20 people in that town who haven't got a group. They contact those 20 people, they organize Heading for Extinction Talk and they set the group up, okay? So that's the broad framework of it. But something that needs to be quite sensitively designed is the relationship between full-time people, particularly full-time paid people and volunteers. And as I'm sure you know, this relationship can be done well or it can be done badly. So when it's done badly, then that person takes a hierarchical attitude and tells everyone what to do. And when it's done well, it involves people engaging enthusiastically with volunteers. So one of the things we did in the UK and what's getting rolled out in Australia is the idea that um, every state or every region has a weekly or fortnightly mobilization recruitment Zoom, right? So anyone in that state who's interested in mobilizing can come to the Zoom call or come to the meeting 
and get what you might call a rapid training in how to mobilize. And then they join a mobilization team for that state or region or city. And that team meets every week. So it might have three full-time people in it. And then as happened in the Midlands in the UK, it might have 10 or 12 volunteers. And those volunteers are encouraged to engage as much or as little as they like, right? There's no necessary structure. So someone might want to just, you know, organize a heading for extinction talk once a month. That's fantastic. Someone might want to do data inputting. That's fantastic. So the atmosphere is whatever you want to do. It's great. And I'm here as a full time organizer to support you. And that seems to be the game changer because that enables you to level up the mobilization process, if you see what I mean. Because instead of just being a single person running around a little area of Germany, you know, pulling your hair out because you've got too much to do, you're basically levering the enthusiasm of others. And obviously, it, you know, mathematically, it's a no brainer. If you've got, you know, 100 hours a week of mobilization in an area, you're going to get lots more results than, than just having 30 or 40. Okay, so um, yeah, so in turn, you know, just to say what I, what the sort of work I've been doing and the work I've been doing with various other individuals around the world is we've been asked to, I mean, this is largely an informal process, we've been asked to help with mobilization processes. And the power relationship is such that we're simply advisors in, 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 in helping people to mobilize. So, you know, like the relationship here in this meeting, I'm telling you some ideas. It's entirely up to you whether you want to take them on or not, right? I'm not the leader of XR, just for the record. You know, I'm just some bod who's got some good ideas and done some research, right? And it's up to you to take what you think works and make it work in, 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 in your situation. And in so much as you might like me to do further sessions on it, then I'm available to do that on the basis of, of that power relationship. I'm simply there to advise. And what we've instituted in the States and Australia were, was, is basically an informal network. So there's activists around the world and I can pull those people in. I can do, you know, to help with action design, to help with psychology of mobilization and such like. So people that have actually done the work can get on a Zoom with you and actually show you how you know they set up 20 groups in the Midlands. You see what I mean? So it's not, I'm really a conduit. So you can talk horizontally around the world to other people that have actually done what you want to do, which obviously is very empowering for everyone concerned. Okay. So what, what I, that, that's my sort of, you know, scholarly opinion, as you might say, right? And, I'm 80% certain all those things are really good ideas. As I said, it's up to you whether you take them on and, you know, to a certain extent, there's cultural factors and political factors and what have you. But broadly speaking, these are transcultural dynamics, right? Just as long as you're in the Western world, let's say. Okay, so what I want to finish off by saying is just putting forward a few speculative and provocative points about the culture of XR around the world and why I think the culture of XR needs to fundamentally change in order for us to be successful in this mobilization process. And I just want to reiterate the point that political morality, as far as I can see, is not at this stage in history subject to your opinion or your ideology or what you say, right? And political morality is now based upon your ability to bring 3,000 arrestable people into Berlin or into Frankfurt who are willing to be arrested because that's what creates legislative change. And legislative change is the center point of moral action. That's what's going to save people's lives, right? So mobilization isn't an add-on, right, for any morally obliged activist. It's at the center of what they should be about, okay? So what, what I want to go through is a number of cultural and philosophical problems we have with the climate movement and why we're not fulfilling our obligations at this point. So these are, gem, are generalizations, of course, and I'll say as a caveat that 
there's plenty of honourable and important exceptions to the rule. But the first and most fundamental problem is that Extinction Rebellion, particularly outside Britain, has been adopted by a very narrow demographic. And that narrow demographic is urban, middle class, educated, liberal left or radical left, right? And that's a very small demographic. And I'm not criticizing those people, I'm broadly in that demographic myself. Well, my proposition to you is that mass civil resistance never works with only mobilizing that demographic. That demographic has to be part of a wider cultural uh, uh, alliance, right? And I'm saying cultural here, right? Specifically, because it's not primarily about political categories. So, for instance, in terms of the psychology, you know, the sociology of revolution, which you might want to check out, revolutions are successful when many different groups come together. And historically, the most important groups are small business people, farmers, and religious people, right? Because those are the middle ground groups. Once you get those people into an oppositional frame, then you can bring about structural political change. And they're ambiguous, all those groups, on the climate emergency, which means they can be brought in if you're sympathetic to their cultures. Now, their cultures are broadly what you might call conservative, but they're only conservative with a small c. And the proposition is that all conservatives with a small c should be mad as hell about the destruction of tradition, right? <laughs> There's no big deal there. So the main barriers for them becoming engaged in mobilization are to do with culture, language, and, you know, the arrogance, as it were, of the urban radical left. So, for instance, like with religious people, it's an appeal to their religious frame about what Christianity would say about the destruction of the world. With farmers, I'm a farmer, so I'm aware of what turns farmers on. Farmers are well aware of what's happening. They need to know that this is like terminal. It's going to destroy their livelihoods, their land, and what have you, with small business people. Small business people are on the front line of the climate crisis because it's those who are going to lose their incomes most quickly. We can see this with COVID. You know, small businesses are destroyed. They don't get state subsidies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so so that's that's the, the the generic point here is, and this is where I disagree with a lot of radical left people is the climate emergency narrative has to be primarily moral, not political, right? Because as soon as you make it political, you're back to tribal like antagonisms, right? I mean, you might agree that it's political, but in terms of mobilization, your appeal has to be to the moral and cultural framing of your audience, right? And obviously to a certain extent, that's universal, or at least it's Christian and Republican in so much as those are the two main moral frames of Western culture, right? You know, it's about caring for others and it's about your civil duty. And um, we can talk about a bit about that. Sorry that okay. I'm getting in here at this point, but Sorry? that I feel really uncomfortable at the moment in this talk here, because it was for me explained as a discussion with Roger Hellam. And that's why I, why I came in here. And I'm asking all the people sitting here from XR Germany, why Roger Hallam or you, Roger, have to tell us this and not anybody else can tell us the talking points and why a person who really was not able to to uh, to hold on the agreements with the restorative justice process and put many damage on XR Germany has to provide these points here. I think we are only providing a stage to Roger Hallam and I want to say that I, I don't feel comfortable with this. And if it gets published on social media, like Roger said on the beginning, this will cause a lot of damage more to XR Germany. So I am really feeling bad in this situation. And I don't know how we should act now, but I don't think that we should just let it go like this. Yeah, well, if you, if you wish to leave Lorenz, then that's fine. If you wish to make a complaint about it, that's fine. But as I said at the beginning, This is not an Extinction Rebellion event, right? It's a communication between 18 or whatever freely acting individuals. 
if you don't want to be on the call, it's fine. And obviously, if people want to put it on social media, that's, you know, a liberty that we have. And obviously, you disagree with what I'm saying, which is totally fine. I'm more than happy to discuss those issues with you. But I would respectfully ask you to allow me to continue. I've only got about another five minutes and then we can have a discussion about it and people can take it forward as they see. But I just want to make that absolutely clear, right? This is not an Extinction Rebellion event. It's a discussion between a number of individuals about what needs to happen, you know, broadly speaking. So I, I, um, I'll continue for the next five minutes. Jan, if, unless it's a clarifying question, would it be possible for you to ask it at the end or do you want to ask it now? It's not a clarifying question. It's um, exactly to, to what Laura was talking, uh, Lawrence was just mentioning right now, and you're stating that this is not an Extinction Rebellion meeting. Well, I get that you might want it not to be an Extinction Rebellion meeting. I find it very hard for this not to be an Extinction Rebellion meeting simply because it's been published on our internal Metamos uh, channels with at all marks reaching over 8,000 people via email, um, promoting it that way. Um, I think it's impossible to say that it's not an Extinction Rebellion meeting. I mean, everybody who's here is probably an active rebel in different capacities. Um, and I also have some, some worries that this, what we're doing right now, might lead to um, troubles, to harm to the German movement. Um, and while I get that you want to talk about content, um, I have a fear that it might lead to more demobilization than to anything that you might wish. And that's why I find it hard to actually talk about the con uh, content while these worries have not been addressed properly. Um, and that's why I'm sort of also stuck a little bit, not sure um, if it's good to finish the talk now and the last five minutes you have and then go somewhere else or maybe try and clear this discussion now so that um, we can see what is what might be a sensible solution for all of us to continue and not lead to harm because I believe that's Whatever we hear, none of us want harm for Extinction Rebellion. Okay, so what, what I suggest is I spend the next five minutes finishing my talk and then we have some discussion around it and, and then we take it from there. Would that be okay? Okay, so... Yeah. I mean, I'm, go I'm going to finish off um, just talking more broadly. And as I said, these aren't points which I'm trying to say are necessary right. But I think in a spirit of open communication, I think they're things that need to be considered. Um, so one of my concerns around the mobilization situation is within left-wing circles, there's a culture of purity, what I would call secular Calvinism, which is to see the world in black and white terms. And the problem with that, there's a number of moral and political problems with it, but from a mobilization point of view, it's very difficult to create a mass movement if, it's, if there's a significant level of perceived intimidation in meetings or in the culture. And this may be well meant, of course, because people are very passionate views. But as I see it, the original ethos of Extinction Rebellion, in terms of what the co-founders were trying to construct, and certainly in terms of the science of mobilization, creating a purist and judgmental culture is massively demoralizing for people in terms of creating a mass movement. And what Extinction Rebellion was set up to do was to question that culture and move beyond it, right? I mean, everyone who was sitting in the room two years ago is broadly from the radical left. But what we were trying to do was fundamentally challenge that culture in order for ordinary people, as you might say, people that don't have a self-understanding of being political to feel welcomed into the movement. And that had a moral basis behind it, of course, but also a practical basis, because as I've tried to reiterate, civil resistance is numbers game, and it's about engaging with a large number of people. And this relates to my last but one point, which is, I think there's a philosophical problem here, 
which I think is quite ironic because I think the radical left likes to think of itself as highly moral and highly politically correct. But what modern psychology has shown, I think, is that the, the psychology of, of, of the political left and of conventional politics is highly alienating and highly dubious because it's rooted in the objectivism of the enlightenment, which assumes that people make decisions on the basis of moral inquiry and makes decisions on the basis of political debate. And in actuality, people make decisions on the basis of sociability. In other words, how they feel rather than what they think. And one of the reasons that the left has been so unsuccessful in my view is because it misunderstands this fundamental point about human psychology, which is, is what human beings want to do is feel like validated and recognized. And of course, in the context of a puritanical culture, that does exactly the opposite thing. So the last point I want to make, I guess, is um, is 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 about the German context and its influence upon XR. And one of the in in the in the interview that the Holocaust comments came out. The broader, more interesting aspects of that discussion was the relationship between um, the aspects of German social thought and its influence upon Extinction Rebellion. As, as you should know, Extinction Rebellion came out of two years of social and political research by a, a bunch of academics and activists. And there were two main influences on Extinction Rebellion. There was the American civil civil disobedience tradition, right? Which, as we all know, is was you know centered around Martin Luther King, and Martin Luther King, as we know, was influenced very much by Gandhi, who was influenced by Tol Tolstoy and and Thoreau. But it's the idea of moral action, transgressive action, and that was that tradition was perfected to a certain extent by the civil rights movement. So what we were trying to do was take it, take that action philosophy. But we were also trying to combine that with what I would call like, and maybe this is an accurate way of putting it, is the, the philosophy of communication, which is rooted in German, the German tradition, particularly with Hannah Arendt and Habermas, right? So my understanding of having studied both those two philosophers is the proposition that humanity and humanness is rooted in dialogue and deliberation. It's not rooted in the imposition of particular viewpoints. And this isn't just a sort of old liberal idea. It's rooted in the idea that through, through freely entering into dialogue, then human beings produce their greatest level of sociability and civilized behavior. And of course, this philosophical basis has been often taste, it's been supported by the empirical research on citizens' assemblies. But when you bring people together, they, they create connection, emotional sympathy, and you produce compassionate and, and humane outcomes for the social body. And so for me... So where is the compassion in a Holocaust relativation? And where is the compassion when people point that out, that it's offensive? How can you say that, like, from communication comes compassion, you being the person who is talking so offensive to make your point and even disregarding people asking you to change that? Yes, well, I think you raise an important point, but with all due respect, I think we've got a process in this meeting of me finishing my talk and then people discussing things. And I think one of the key elements of this process philosophy is to have structured communication in group settings. And this is one of the things I've spent most of my life working on as, as someone that's involved in participation design. So I, I totally accept what you're saying, but I would respectfully ask you not to interrupt me so that I can finish what I've got to say. And of course, at any point, if someone wants to leave the meeting, then they're free to do so, of course. 
and that's you know just to reiterate again I'm more than happy to talk to people uh, in another meeting about those specific concerns but the, just to finish off like that what I'm trying to say here is you know leaving aside the very important concerns that's just been raised there is a broader sort of challenge here about how to create large movements through this sociability agenda and what i've tried to do in this presentation is create give you what you might call the latest technology as you might say techniques in how to do it but it's basically based upon this this philosophy of communication being at the center of what it is to live a civilized life as you might say so i'm going to leave it there and i would like to suggest if it's okay people put their hands up and i'll take the questions in turn i'm going to um we're at 11 16 now so maybe people want to maybe ask questions for half an hour and then if people want to have a more engaged discussion then they can you know we can organize another occasion to do so either informally or semi-officially or whatever people might think is best okay thank you very much If I can't see you, by the way, you'll have to, you'll have to put a little symbol up <laughs> to say you want to speak. I think Thomas just put his hand up. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, so, my <clears throat> actually, I have uh, a few questions. But the, the first one is that uh, you have said on uh, several occasions that the um, the the goal, or at least the the, the ultimate step, uh, would be to bring down the government. Uh, so what what specifically do you mean by bringing down the government? Well, just to clarify, you know, what I said at the beginning of the talk is everything I've given in this talk is my own view, right? Um, and if people choose to associate it with XOR, then I can't be responsible for that. I make that as clear as I can. Um, so that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is like bring down the government is not like the explicit policy of Extinction Rebellion. So it's a personal view that I have that bringing down Western governments is now necessary. The reason why I think it's necessary and moral is sort of threefold, really. First of all, I think along with a lot of technocratic people who are in the governmental space in Western democracies, they are aware that we haven't got a chance in hell staying below two degrees centigrade and so much as 1.5 is locked in without complete transformation of the industrial economies of the western world and that is only going to be brought about by an emergency mobilization of the political sphere what that means is like for instance i talked to you know a major uh, advisor uh, to government and he said what's necessary is to shut down the oil industry in six months so that's not going to be done by the present political regime because that's not what they're about. So that's the first reason, point about bringing down the government. The second and more sort of broader reason is because the, all the governments of the Western world are now guilty of genocide because they've already locked in over 1.5 degrees centigrade. So from a moral point of view, they need to be re replaced. The specifics of how to bring down the government and what to do about it uh, de have been detailed elsewhere. but. The, the proposition amongst what you might call forward thinking uh, revolutionaries in the Western world is we're not looking at the imposition of some anarchist chaos or some Leninist dictatorship. What we're trying to work towards is a new form of radical democratic constitution where citizens assemblies are at the forefront of national decision making. So one model of that, for instance, is a thousand people are selected from, from a country and they stand for a year in, a, in an assembly, a people's assembly, and they make decisions on the critical issues of the day and have a legally binding decision in the sense that they can't be trumped by what you might call corrupted politicians who are there only because of you know corporate sponsorship and what have you. 
So there's a, there's a moral aspect to it, but there's also like a practical aspect to it. Yeah, but, but what does, I mean, the, the government won't just happily say, oh, well, we are going to uh, just lose all our power, basically, and just give it over to these uh, citizens' assemblies. So what at some point, uh, how, how does, well, what does actually bringing down the government, I mean, that's, that's not a very, I mean, it can be interpreted in different ways, right? So, so what would that point be when the government is brought down? That's, uh, what would that point be? You mean, do you, yeah. do you want me to describe how revolutions happen? Yeah, I mean, the, so what, um, yeah, I mean, I, I know all the, like, uh, yeah, gathering a lot of people, then uh, collecting them, uh, marching towards the, the capital, but then what would be the point where it's actually the government is being brought down? Because, uh, I mean, lots of people, uh, especially in Germany, uh, have a bit of a problem with governments being brought down because we have a bit of a bad experience with that. So, um, I, I would yes, well, what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is, is that the, the, the governments of the Western world are now incapable of reducing carbon emissions by the amount that's needed in order to prevent a substantial possibility of social collapse and functional extinction in the next half century, right? That's the reality of the situation. So it's not a situation of going, we're going to have a nice liberal democracy in Germany or anywhere else for the next 50 years, or we're going to follow Roger Hallam's mad idea of bringing down the government, right? The, the options are social collapse or a substantial transformation in the political regime. So let me, right? I mean, bring down the government is a rhetorical, is a rhetorical phrase. It's not meant to be interpreted as an analytical proposition. The analytical proposition is a substantive change in the power structures of Western societies that enable popular and democratic and deliberative democracy to take place. And the mechanism through which that takes place, I would suggest, is through a one or two year process of structural conflict between mass civil resistance and the creation of parallel institutions, right? That's happened many times in European history, and it happens regularly in the global south. It doesn't need to involve mass violence. It can be done through mass civil disobedience. Now, having said that, there's no absolute guarantees, of course, but it's like something that a lot of people think is now necessary, and a lot of people that actually work in the system think it's necessary, right? Because they can see that all the procrastination is basically structurally set. It's not because, you know, the president of France or of Germany wants to, you know, doesn't want to bring about climate change. There's massive power, power formations in Western democracies, which are implacably opposed to radical decarbonisation, as hopefully we all know. And the only way that's going to be dealt with is by a transformation in political power. So that's the proposition. Um, can was there someone else had their hand up? Yes, I w I have a question. Um, just one, one thing. There's also star stars in the chat, and people are writing stars. Basically, just like to put up a finger. That's the same. Oh, thing. sorry, I can't see nine. that. So maybe someone could help me. Um, <laughs> I think uh, Roger. I think Lara was put forward by um, Jan um to speak could you take lara I, i've got yeah lara. I, I, I would they, like to prioritize people that haven't spoken so that it's not just two or three people and what have you so lara. yeah if audley could you possibly facilitate it it's quite difficult for me to keep an eye on things okay i'll, uh, I'll, sorry try, about and, that, I'll try and facilitate um <laughs> or just uh, so lara. Lara. Yeah, lara lara go ahead yeah. sorry about that um yes thanks just one comment lawrence is that directly to the topic before because i would i would have a different one yeah i'm not sure if you should go in there deeply but when you're when you're uh when you're saying you want and we wanting citizens assembly like doing all the national wide or the, the main national wide decisions uh, aren't you uh, 
forgetting that the power in citizens' assemblies are is really much in the facilitating team, is really much in raising the question for citizens' assembly, as we can see in UK. Um, so this sort of power still exists, and you can't say that the citizens' assemblies and, and just are making like better decisions or are acting by their own because they need questions, they need to be facilitated and all the stuff around has many influence on the process. So you could make a really bad citizens assembly with some bad decisions in the end if the process is really bad. So this, I just wanted to, to state this point here. Yeah. yeah. Well, Lara, I, I, sorry, Roger, Roger, Lara, are you okay with that? Because this was really your, your question. Are you okay for Roger to reply to that? Well, yeah, do you absolutely. want to add, add to it, Laura? Is there any other aspects you want to raise? Um, well, it's not far away from what Lauren said, but I will continue after you, you answer to that, if you like to. Yes, so I think, Lauren's. yeah, you've raised a really important point there. And I think it's worth emphasizing that there's no utopian idealism here, right? what we're looking at is creating a radical democratic deliberative culture, which still will be imperfect in many respects, because there's no such thing as a perfect political process. But what we should be aware of is the substantial moral and technical advantages of making decisions by citizens' assemblies. And I think there's a big difference between what you might call elite-initiated citizens' assemblies where an elite basically, as you rightly say, sets a question and then the elite has the option to ignore it or, more, or water it down and what you might call citizens' assemblies which are created in a context of civil resistance where a mass movement demands a question of a citizens' assembly and the mass movement creates the agenda, okay? So that's really what the optimal scenario is, which again, you know, has a number of problems associated with it. But in so much as we can see that civil resistance and revolutionary situations are functional in terms of creating a more civilized society and a more equitable society, what, what the sociology of revolution points to, I would suggest, is a creative interaction between a street movement and alternative institutionalization. In other words, they're not sequential, they're coincidental. So a street movement creates a demand for us, an assembly, and then the assembly gradually accumulates power vis-a-vis -vis the old power structure. And there's an interaction between those two things, and that might take a year or two to play out, or even a decade. But that's really how it works. And obviously, obviously it's messy and all the rest of it, but that's how I see radical political process is, is largely formed and there's different degrees of extremity around it, depending upon the political context. Um, yeah. Um, Laura, did you want to come back on that or shall we go over to Michael? Um, I would like to, to continue if that's fine. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I feel uncomfortable with the situation here due to two things I think. First is that um, it has a public dimension and in this public dimension people are acting strategically to prevent XR Germany from having harm and I'm totally on this. But this on the other hand leads to, um, to an aggressive tone that I would not want between two people and this is not what I think people should talk to with each other and i think this is a this is a stressful point between political action and personal action and i just wanted to say that that i feel uncomfortable with this and i've witnessed this in xr germany um, discussions a lot and it's not a culture that i want and i cannot i don't have a solution for these two actions for the political public action and the connection between people. Um, this is this is this is just for the discussion. I just wanted to say that um, because I think it's missing. Um, and for the talk um, that you gave, Roger, I have I have some. I took some parts from it that I really can process, and I'm thankful. And um, I want to give feedback on two 
two mixed feelings there. And the first time it arose was when you used the word persuasion. Because persuasion is not agreeing. It's rather something that I know from my studies on propaganda, which in Germany, of course, is mostly right wing. Um, anyway, if, if it wasn't, it's fine. Um, but persuasion for me means not the free will and not deliberation. It's, it's faster, of course, it works for any movement. I get the point for mobilization. I get the strategic point, though it conflicts with my values there. And you might call it left. It, it could be, um, though I think, um, what about us as XR Germany providing a culture that is the utopia we want to live in? And is this the utopia we want to live in? So persuading people, having some core full-time organizing facilitators, um, which organize the meetings, which are doing the network and which are um, running the information. So information is power. We know that from Foucault, right? Um, and it's people that talk a lot, that are loud, that are dominant, that want to put forward things. And we have those people in XR Germany and they're doing a wonderful work, really. I, I appreciate them, though we have a problem there that those people are sitting in knots of power. And this prevents people from helping. We have that in the strategic um, work group that we have, that we have, I say, one person that has a lot of connections, a lot of power, and this prevents people from saying, hey, I can share work with you because the people that could share the work say, I cannot come up to this knowledge and to this level of professionality. So this split kind of backfires on us now because it prevents people to participate. And this ultimately causes, I think, burnouts and it causes, it causes less participation. And it specifically makes women, I think, not go into those roles of power, into mandates. Um, so I'm, I'm worried a lot about this power distrib distribution there. And I don't know how to solve it. I really don't know, but this is the current problem. And I think we have a culture that focuses on loud dominant voices and the small voices kind of have the mark of being weak. Although 50% of the public is introverted and they are attracted by means and methods that are more towards introverted, not towards extroverted. That's a really interesting science there. Um, and I'm extrovert myself, I think, so I have not really the insights there. I can only feel this, yeah, this yeah. voice is yeah. being pushed down. Maybe this is, this is the part that I'm kind of having in my head and I'm, I'm not sure if I can, if I no. can follow this mass mobilization there. All right, yeah. all right, all right. Thank you. I mean, we could listen. Um, yeah, yeah, that's back. fine. I mean, you, you've, you've raised a whole bunch of interrelated, complicated challenges there, right? So my, my main sort of response to it is the devil's in the detail, right? It's very easy to construct general causal relationships. You know, if you do this, that will cause that, uh, which don't, aren't particularly very useful in the practical design of mobilization. What I'm trying, one of the main things I'm trying to communicate is the, the actuality of empowerment and participation depends upon not generalized sort of design principles, but micro design principles. In other words, like how people treat each other in a space, right? So, you know, I've just draw out one or two sort of themes, like how people, how people talk to each other is enormously important, as I think you've sort of described, right, in terms of aggressive, aggressive speech and such like. So that's one, one aspect of disempowering people. I think some, some of an, another key element is the amount of time people have to speak. So one of the things that I found empirically most dramatic is the more you can structure enabling more people to speak, then 
the more empowered they will be. And, and that's a structural design issue, you know, like having a go round or having breakout groups. That seems to be very effective in, in terms of self-reported empowerment. And, and I think as far as having paid people to do things and what have you, I think you're right. There are very big dangers of that, but there are also very big opportunities. And to be honest with you, I haven't quite teased out what those are in a very coherent way. But I am aware that when it's done well, a team leader in inverted commas can what you might call bring people on and encourage people to become more participatory and more empowered, particularly women in a, in a space. And the other aspect of the money side of things is, is that a lot of people are practically prevented from engaging in social movements because of lack of time and money. And what that what that creates is a middle class movement, you know, inadvertently, as you might say. So that doesn't mean that paying people isn't full of quite a lot of difficulties, right? It is. But what we need to be aware of is if we don't have some form of financial compensation, then inadvertently you will create, you know, particularly the high powered positions, as you might say, becoming dominated by middle class voices. And that's bad for lots of reasons, which I've discussed in terms of mass mobilisation. Um, so, yeah, you know, this is what I'm here to suggest to you. And I'm offering my insights in a spirit of service towards you, right? You must take what you think is useful and leave the rest, right? It's not a, I'm not handing this down from on high. <laughs> it's an ongoing dialogue and it's an ongoing process of research. And that's what I'm trying to encourage. Um, yeah. Who was next? Can I suggest Judith, who hasn't spoken yet, and then Michael and Heiner? Is that okay? And I'll try and hold on to everyone else. We've been going for an hour and a quarter. So, um, Judith. Thanks so much. Well, actually, I have spoken already. <laughs> um, okay, sorry, forgive me. <laughs> yeah, well, um, but thank you for letting me speak again. Um, so to me, it's really important, and I also see it in the principles and values of Extinction Rebellion, to try and live um, the better world that we are trying to build, because we need to build it ourselves, and we cannot build it only talking about object and strategy, but also reflecting on ourselves and listening to each other. And therefore, as we all, like, stand behind these principles and values, I believe. Um, I would like to ask Roger, as a fellow human, you have been asked to refrain from offensive speak, speech uh, about the Holocaust and other, other things. Um, and you refused that in a restorative justice process continuously. And I would like to ask you once again, can you would you now agree to refraining from, from these uh, points that have been pointed out to be considered offensive by many people? It is the Holocaust relativation, but also other things. Can you do that? Yeah, well, thanks for the question. So just to clarify, uh, my understanding of the restorative justice process, and I went through uh, two sessions which lasted for several hours, um, I think the process that came out of that was a number of things which everyone agreed on and some things that some people didn't agree on. And myself and um, Tim Crossland, who I worked with, with on it, like made a number of proposals and then XR Germany made a number of proposals. And I said what I could agree with and what I couldn't agree with. So my understanding of the situation was that was that I would liaise with XR Germany and any pronouncements I was going to make, which might relate to Germany or XR. And uh, what some people in XR Germany wanted me to do was to make a, a commitment not to talk about the Holocaust in any capacity at any point in the future. And I had to inform them that, unfortunately, I couldn't make an absolute commitment to not talk about something that lots of people talk about. So. Um, that's my position and obviously I'm sorry that some people feel like they have 
the need to tell me what I should or should not talk about as an individual. But unfortunately, I can't agree to that for what I hope are reasonably obvious reasons. Um, I, as far as my intentions are concerned, like I'm not, as I said initially, I'm, the last thing that I'm interested in is causing, uh, causing harm or causing uh, upset. But as we all know, if you tell the truth, then inevitably that causes upset. And the, so the main challenge here, as you might say, is how you can communicate things that need to be communicated um, and do so in a way that's assertive but also respectful. And that's an ongoing, an ongoing challenge, I suppose, uh, mm -hmm. as it is for people that have criticized me. Mm -hmm. I would suggest they have a similar challenge. There we are. Thank you, Roger. Is it is it okay with the group if I take Michael and then Heine? Is that okay? So, all right. Thank you, Lara. Um, thank you, Jan. So, Michael and then Heine. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm, I'm not going to speak about the issue of the Holocaust. I, I don't find it serious to have a ten minute discussion about this issue. Um, so I, I I don't feel like it's 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 enough respect for the issue to really talk about it. Um, I, I could say I, I I didn't understand your last comment about telling the truth, and I hope that you you're not saying that the truth is that the Holocaust is just another event. Um, I hope that's not what you meant. But I, I will go to 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 the mobilization issue, which is actually related, um, because I think that uh, when we talk about uh, pulling down the government, taking down the government uh, for any uh, reason or issue. Um, I think it's really important to know that we have a uh, important cultural infrastructure that's gonna be able to deal with, with such a tremendous change. Um, and I think that embedded in XR is our, uh, our, our new culture and, and dealing with each other. And, and it, a lot of people mention it and it's interesting that it's really such a topic because I think it's so important when we talk about a radical organization that is about to, that's calling for a, a very radical change, which is pulling down the government, that we do have a, really an alternative culture amongst ourselves because that creates a certain amount of trust amongst us. And when we're seeing that the practice of the, the cultural practice amongst us is one of a poisonous culture that we're trying to change, and there's elements of that for sure within XR that creates a little bit of a, um, uh, I'm not sure, not clear, not sure that I wanna be in a revolution with these people around me. Um, so how do we keep the balance of talking about revolution and talking about changing and bringing down the government because of cultural, because of uh, climate change, but also really internalize those behaviors and be able to manage dealing with each other in a way that is gonna give us the assurances that we're together as a family. And I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that we've really created that within uh, Extinction Rebellion. I mean, if we look at what happened in the States between USA and America, if we look at the dialogue that goes on in a lot of circles, I feel that we haven't really internalized that new culture yet. And how are we supposed to trust a revolution when we ourselves can't manage to deal with the new culture in the right way? Yeah, yeah, well, great question. <laughs> if I had the answer to that, I'd be uh, very happy. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, just to clarify, telling the truth is, is, does not mean putting down the Holocaust and all the rest of it, right? I'm making a generic point about speaking your truth. I've already said what I think about that in my introduction. So, um, and I agree with you, it's a longer discussion. So I, I, I I'll just move on to responding to your, your main question. And, um, and, you know, just to preface it, I mean, I, I, this is very complicated, right? So it's not going to get sorted out uh, very quickly because what we've known for the last 200 years is that revolutions more often than not basically recreate the same problems that they're trying to sort out, particularly if they're violent. Um, so the first thing to say is, is, is that a revolution has to be a non-violent discipline at its core, otherwise it's fucked. Like 95% of the violent revolutions lead to totalitarianism 
or um, or civil war within five years of happening. So that's you know that's pretty damning, <laughs> even if you just want to be empirical about it. As uh, you know, okay, but there is substantive evidence that nonviolent revolutions or civil resistance uh, uh, episodes can be largely moral and functional in terms of moving society onto a more equitable uh, 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 regime. And I think the key structural determinant here is to move out of the political cliques. For me, and this might sound controversial, I have been in radical politics for a lot, 34 years, is radical politics is fundamentally a violent space because it's based upon a Calvinistic orientation of morality, which is if I'm right, you're wrong. And if you're wrong, I have a right to do you in, right? Verbally or traditionally by doing you physical harm. So the old sort of violence of the left, which you, you know, led to Stalinism and all the rest of it, has got transmuted to social media, which is the assumption that if you're wrong, then I can screw you over, right? And what Extinction Rebellion was specifically set up to do was to challenge that culture of, of trying to destroy people through, through abuse, right? So that's the first thing. So what, what needs to happen is there needs to be clear rules on group process. And there's a whole industry, right, based upon how to do that. You know, empathy circles, uh, group, group participation, you know, stuff that Habermas did. You know, there's a load of different elements to it. But I, what I would suggest is the other structural element is to create a mass movement. The reason why the movement hasn't degenerated into a left-wing cult in the UK is because a substantial number of people in Extinction Rebellion in the UK have never been involved in politics before. And they have what you might call a commonsensical sociability, right? They, they're not bothered about the minutiae of various political debates. What they're bothered about is forming good relationships with each other and getting on with the job. Now, I'm not saying that ordinary people are somehow saints or anything stupid like that. And I'm not even saying that they're better than political people. What I'm saying is, is that if you want to create a human revolution, you need to have a productive synergy between what you might call ordinary people and political people. Because the political people need to need to educate the ordinary people, as it were, in you know, the dynamics of political power. It's very important. But what the ordinary people do is they inform the political people of what it is to be cool, right? <laughs> you know, and enjoy life and enjoy the everyday, you know, uh, so that we don't get sucked into this dark, dark world of 20th century destructive politics. And if the 20th century is going to survive, I would suggest it requires us to move on beyond that Calvinistic, hateful, you know, di 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 nasty, 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 nastiness, right? <laughs> that, that characterizes radical politics. And, um, you know, I, as someone that's been on the end of it, I mean, it's an occupational hazard. But Thank you. I'd say those, yeah. are the two, those are the two structural, structural agenda items. Thank, th th thank you, no Roger. Guarantee. There's no guarantee, Michael. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> don't, don't give me a hard time if it doesn't work. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Roger. I'm very mind. I'm mindful of time, but um, can I take Kirsten and Kirsten and Heiner then? Please? Yeah, and then we'll draw it to a close, and we can discuss if people want to contact me to have further discussion. Unless, sorry, unless that, that should have been Heiner and then Kirsten. Can you put? I think. Sorry, Kirsten. I think that was Heiner, then Kirsten. I do apologize. Heiner. Okay. Roger, you're probably aware of the movement that calls itself Querdenken in Germany. They're against the COVID-19 measures, which is currently uniting people from across the political spectrum, including right-wing extremists against the government. What do you think of movements like these? Well, my understanding of movements like those is they're doing they're doing two things well, which the left doesn't do well, which is one of the reasons why the right is in the ascendant, broadly speaking. I think 
and again, this is my personal opinion, by the way. So I think the first thing they're doing is, is they're providing sociability, right? They're providing a support structure for groups in society or individuals in society that feel very alienated. So as a psychologist, I would say that the politics of it is not actually that important, right? People going and, and expressing a discontent which they individually feel, and because they're doing it collectively, they're getting a psychological benefit from it. And which leads me on to the broader, more important point, which is a lot of the people who are disenfranchised in society are not being spoken to by the left because the left is Calvinistic and moralistic, right? It, and, and that's forcing them to move into the right. And you can see this, you know, there's, I'm not saying anything original here. I, it's probably the biggest issue in progressive intellectual life in the Western world is why the uneducated people have structurally moved to the right over the last 30 years. And it's not really like rocket science, right? You know, if, if, if you enter a, a space of normal people, you know, lorry drivers or miners or, you know, delivery drivers, whatever, and you start to talk to them in the language of educated middle-class urban intellectuals, right? They just think you're a twat. <laughs> because that's the language of oppression for them. That's the language which has been used for 30 years to betray them to the negative consequences of globalization. So the, the response to that is to create participatory forums like people's assemblies, where people can speak, you know, in their own language and they can speak with each other and they can co-create positive and progressive and sociable solutions to the, to the social problems we have. In other words, it's not talking to people, it's enabling people to talk, right? That should be the watchword of any sort of progressive uh, situation. And, um, and dare I say, you know, in my view, we've got to get on with it, right? Which is why I'm challenging a lot of left orthodoxies and um, getting into trouble as a result. Thank, um, yeah, thank, well, that's thank, a broad outline. Thank you, Roger. Sorry, thank you everyone for going on with all of this. Um, Kirsten, and then if you are able to, please, Roger, Rudiger. Thank you. So, Kirsten. Okay, we'll just take those two and then we'll stop, yeah, so people can go and have their dinner. <laughs> okay. Kirsten yeah. and then Rudiger. Yes, thanks, Roger. Um, in Germany, uh, there is a climate camp, uh, which has been there for 100, 170 days at the doorstep of their mayor. And they are telling them to not go away until this crisis is solved. Um, and um, I'm seeing a lot of potential in concept like this to do alternatives in recruitment and mobilization, because those camps also draw uh, people in. And it's uh, really easy to go there and talk to them. Uh, on the other side, I see uh, movements like uh, like Occupy, who did uh, um, si similar things like this, um, but obviously Occupy failed. So I would like to ask you, what's your opinion about this? Are there other um, uh, mobilization strategies that could work, which go into into directions like like this? Well, again, you know, any particular tactic is is difficult to give. A sort of generic assessment of it, right? Because any tactic is, it's a, the effectiveness of any tactic, any nonviolent tactic is basically subject to the context, right? So sometimes it might work and sometimes it might not work. So that's the first thing to say. So it's not like, you know, camps are intrinsically good or bad. Uh, it depends on, 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 the, on, on the situation. And the situation that determines whether they're a good idea or a bad idea is largely about the connectivity to the local population. So well, that's a posh way of saying, you know, is it a bunch of alienated young people that don't like other people and keep to themselves and don't have anything to do with the local people? Or is it part of a, <clears throat> a genuine community mobilization that includes people's assemblies and, you know, people there every Saturday bringing food and, you know, there's a bud Good, good interaction, as I've tried to say, between what you might call the political people and the ordinary people. So if the latter is happening, then it can lead to mass mobilization, um, which obviously, you know, is the aim. 
uh, if, it, if it becomes insular and, you know, reactive and exclusive and all the rest of it through sort of aggressive politics, then it can be quite disastrous. <laughs> Let's put it like that. So there's a wide range of, of possibilities. But I, I would say the more structural point here is that if you're trying to design mass mobilization, you have to design it around the idea that people have a limited amount of time because they've got to earn a living. So what that means is, is you know, mass demonstrations on a Saturday, right? Every Saturday, you can see that in the French uprising, or a, a short, sharp shop, which is the classical civil resistance mode, which is everyone goes to the cities for two weeks and then you create substantial change, right? Very few people have the ability financially to go to a camp and stay there. So a camp is always going to be a sort of a peripheral part of uh, overall strategy. I don't mean to be at all critical in that sense, you know, but it, it, you know, in terms of the overall design. So the, the main show is the fortnight routine or the Saturday demonstration routine. And those can synergize with, the, with, with having camps, of course, so which, you know, are part of the mix. So yeah, that's, that'd be my broad orientation on it. Um, yeah, uh, who was the last person? Sorry, thank uh, you, Roger. I think Ru that was Rudiger. meant to be me. Rudiger. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I have another question, but to the strategic aspect of those interviews you gave last year in autumn. Um, you described your strategic calculus in a letter to XR Germany as designing a moral trap for corrupt media. And that's why you made that Holocaust comparison in every single interview to build that trap, as far as I understood. Now, obviously, the strategy of yours was wildly unsuccessful and incredibly harmful to Exa Germany. And uh, with hundreds of level, rebels leaving the movement afterwards and our actual goals having become harder than ever to reach three XR, so it did not exactly spur mass mobilization. My question is, how would that strategy have worked out in Germany in your mind? How did you actually manage being successful with what you did? Well, as I've said on the social media after those interviews, and as I've said to a number of people directly, and as I've just said in this, this session, right? For the record, I swearing on my children's lives, right? I did not, I repeat, I did not enter those interviews with a strategic orientation. Here it is, okay? So I would respectfully ask people not to make that proposition as if it's a matter of fact. You might want to say that I'm a liar, which is perfectly fine. But you can't say it's a matter of fact because it's not, okay? So, you know, whether, whether, whether a strategy that, um, uh, whether a strategy that, entices the media to come down on a like a ton of bricks on you and then you turn around is good or bad is another issue and i'll deal with that now so yes my what what i think is the following which is is the most effective way to change the world is to tell is to tell the truth as you see it and how i envisage the climate change catastrophe space is that it's broadly should be seen as a scandal. And a scandal operates by repressing truth telling. In other words, an evil or a, something terrible is happening and people don't want it to be talked about. And in so much as it is talked about, then the people that are in power will try and distort or manipulate or destroy the people that are doing the truth telling. So you see this in, in um, you know, whistleblowing or what have you. So my broader, my broader proposition, and this has no necessary relationship to what happened last year, is that there is a space, and I would argue is a necessary space, to do truth telling in the public sphere that will result in manipulation and aggression by the corporate media and by the ruling class and what have you. And that can be, and is, and has been in the past, turned around to expose the violence in the system. And I would suggest that that's one of the primary mechanisms historically through which 
social change happens and you know it can be done well and it can be done badly as, as i'm sure we'd all agree but um that's that's really my my orientation on on that yeah uh, roger it's it, this is your your call now we've been going for two hours just about coming up jan did have his hand up um yeah i what, what, i I, I think we should leave it there because otherwise it's just going to go on and on. And I'm not saying that because I'm trying to avoid talking to anyone. Uh, I'm very interested to, to hear what people have, have got to say. So what I would suggest is, is that um, we leave it here and myself and Audley from the UK or possibly one or two people from Germany, including Henning, might want to facilitate another session where we might want to discuss other matters, either privately or publicly. And I'm not making any absolute commitments, obviously, but in principle, I'd be very happy to do that uh, and to engage in more open, open dialogue. And I'd just like to say I really uh, feel very uh, pleased that people have given me the chance to speak to them. And I'm a passionate believer in open dialogue and, and speaking publicly about what people have to say as long as it's respectful and what have you. And I look forward to having future communications with people as I have with other people around the world. And, you know, just to reaffirm everything I've said is my own view. Feel free to violently disagree <laughs> and to ignore it. That's absolutely fine. And uh, I wish everyone the best of luck in, in all your endeavours moving forward. And um, I think that is it. Um, Jan, if you want to message me afterwards, I'll have a, a chat with you if that's all right. I'd like to leave it there. Okay. okay. I will. Uh, where Where would I message you the best in that case? Because um, I'll point. put something in. I'll put my email in the chat now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Kirsten, I got the thing about books and we will try and get those on Roger's website which is um, being revamped a bit at the moment and sorry I hadn't intended to facilitate this um, I'm I'm the sorry publisher of common sense for the 21st century over here and so we really hit the Allstein thing it was I just have to say it was an extraordinary evening when we had one of the biggest publishers in Germany pull out so um yeah so i've been continuing on this that's why i'm here um and i'm a rebel in wales but i think i think we've got to end now and thank you yeah. thank you very very, very 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 <laughs> very much okay yeah. thank you very much everyone all and, right um yeah good luck thanks bye